Jetzt ah. ist er. Das sollst du okay. jetzt okay. anmachen. Can you keep it outside? Keep it out of your pocket. And off. The next speaker is Hans Otto Meyer. Hello, we've lost sound, I believe. Thank you. That's good, thanks. Uh, the collisions between the air molecules in the tube and the stored protons, and that induces random sideways motion in the protons. So the beam size grows, and in a few seconds, it's larger than the beam pipe, and the beam gets lost. Electron cooling fixes this problem. In electron cooling, you have an electron beam that moves at the same velocity as the protons. So if you're a proton, the, all the electrons are at rest with the exception of the random motion that have been, has been introduced by the collisions with the air molecules. So if there is a scattering between an electron and a proton, the very much lighter electron gets knocked out to infinity, while the proton slows down in the direction it was moving previously. So the random motion becomes less. This is a dramatic effect. That's a sequence of beam profile measurements over one second. So if you turn on the electron cooling, the beam collapses within a second. And the one of a few second lifetime of the stored beam becomes over an hour. It's so powerful a process that you can actually think about putting air molecules into the stored beam on purpose. That is the storage cell that Erhard was just talking about. Okay. Uh, that's uh, Ger Sputko, who is the genius who invented electron cooling. He was uh, the director of the Institute in Novosibirsk. 
and he invented a lot of other things. He was a member of the Academy of Sciences in Russia. Pollock resigned his job as director because he wanted to construct a cooler in Bloomington. He managed to find the money from the NSF. He convinced the university to put up a new building to house the machine. And he organized all of that single-handedly. Incredible. In 1982, the construction work started. Uh, there was a party of about 40 people working on that thing. And five years later, there was a stored beam in Bloomington. And that's a bonus feature. Whoops. I'm learning this. Okay. As a bonus feature, we had even the possibility of accelerating the stored beam, as you all know, by kicking a little bit whenever the bunch comes by. And we could go up to 500 MeV. Electron cooling soon after was also demonstrated. And uh, we heard from Tom about the principle of these uh, storage cell is a bit of a misnomer. It's just a tube which forces the injected gas atoms to linger near the beam before they get pumped away because they come out the end. And as uh, Tom mentioned, the improvement is about a factor of a hundred. The beam from the cyclotron, which was used to provide the beam to inject into the cooler, was polarized. Uh, polarization in a ring is a story all by itself and worth its own talk, but it's very simple in principle, because all, the, all physics you have to know is the precession of the magnetic moment of the proton in magnetic fields. The details are more complicated. Uh, and uh, some really clever ideas are necessary to overcome some problems which I cannot go into right now. Uh, interesting enough, many of these ideas were produced by the Russians. Uh, in the end, what one gets is a stable polarization. It's actually the lifetime of the polarization is longer than the beam lifetime. Uh, a free choice of the direction of polarization can be up or along or sideways. And it is also possible to flip the spin of the polarization. Uh, flip the sign of the polarization in the middle of a measurement, which is wonderful if you want to eliminate systematic errors. Uh, Willie and I communicated a lot. And of course, he was aware of this development. And he also was aware of the fact that his sources produced a number of polarized atoms per unit time, which is about the most you can cope with with the electron cooling. So there was a match in magnitude. We all knew about that and we talked about it loosely. Um, and then there was this letter of who, who wrote to me from Germany. He was on travel. That was a long, very technical letter. That was the first time he seriously thought about the idea of building a polarized target for the polarized beam in the cooler. This letter exists still, and it's part of a deposition to the Indiana University archives. So if, if you want to see that letter, you can go there and ask for this number. In his letter, Willie was very skeptical about the chance to learn new physics, 
with 200 MeV protons. And uh, I try to ju just talk about the thoughts like that, because just to have a polarized beam and a polarized target uh, at, in, in an environment where you can control both easily is so wonderful. One should do that because something will come out of it. It's just te technologically uh, something that must produce a new result. He was convinced by the time the cooler was dedicated and he gave a talk at the dedication of the cooler. After that, we started building the polarized atom source that was to be used as a polarized source with the Indiana cooler. This is a picture of when we were in Madison uh, talking with really there's Andy Roberts, Alan Ross, Jack Doskow, and this guy we know. And after this period where we built uh, an, a the source in Madison, it was delivered to Bloomington. And uh, that was the start of the Pintex collaboration between the U University of Wisconsin and Indiana University and a number of other institutes. Uh, so there was a number of people in a group who called themselves Pintex, I guess for polarized internal targets or something like that. This is the source. The target polarization also could be pointed each way. And that was easier than with the, the, with the storage ring because all you need is a holding field in the right direction. And this holding field was generated by these coils. There were actually eight of them. Twelve of them, I'm sorry. Um, six who did the work and six to make a field in the opposite direction so the stored beam is not disturbed. And then after this contraction was operational, we started data taking. Uh, this is a typical shot from the counting room in Bloomington with uh, Franz Spreewiesen. This guy, uh, that guy, <laughs> uh, Bernd Lorenz, Paul Quinn, and Bob Pollock. The kind of data that we produced were something else. Uh, this is an example from a publication which shows uh, the measurement of all measurable polarization observables over the entire angular range uh, from 200 MeV to 500 MeV in proton-proton elastic scattering. Previously available data are shown with these blue points and the red dots here with the error bars are not visible because they're way too small to be shown on this scale. Um, our, uh, our production. This was one publication uh, of one measurement. Uh, there was not always a good time to be had in the um, experimental area. There were times when I, I'm sure there are some people in the audience, I'm sure Paul remembers, uh, there was this C35G run where not five minutes went by without another catastrophe. We did just, we spent all that time and measured nothing. And we had to give a lunch talk nevertheless. That I think that was on Tuesdays, the Tuesday lunch talk where the previously um, active experimenters had to get up and give a report on what they did. 
in their um, data taking time. And that was a slide that was actually shown during that meeting. I was looking for a way to convey to you the power and the beauty of the setup. And I was looking for a single example that I could show you to demonstrate what the cool look could do. So let me try. This is a measurement of PP goes to PP pi zero. Uh, this is at an energy which we now could get to because we could accelerate the beam enough to make enough energy to produce a neutral pion. Uh, we knew that this happened, even though that is a very short lived particle. We knew that this was happening because we could measure the two outgoing protons very well because of the target cell that Tom made, which allows to look asymmetrically complete distributions. Uh, so we could measure these two guys wherever they went and measure their energy and the direction. And from that, you can conclude what the mass of the unseen particle is, and you get a very nice clean peak with nothing else. So this is a wonderful clean experiment of pion production. At one point, we had the polarization of the beam longitudinal and the target polarization unpolarized. Uh, we measured this distribution which is the difference in the rate along and the rate opposite is called the longitudinal analyzing power. Um, this parameter here is the angle between the two planes in which the two outgoing protons live. So the outgoing protons are not like this, but like this. And the angle between these two planes is this delta phi parameter. Longitudinal analyzing power in principle in reactions where there are only two particles in the exit channel are forbidden by parity conservation. In this case, that's not so because the, uh, the fact that there are three particles means that there is a way to define a handedness in the exit channel, which could be so or so. So parity conservation does not apply. Uh, nevertheless, people have actually looked for a longitudinal analyzing power in another reaction where there are three particles in the final state like PD goes to PPN. And they looked because, you know, it would be cute to measure a longitudinal analyzing power since nobody ever has seen such a thing. Uh, but in that case, it was zero. So in our case, that would have been the first measurement of a longitudinal analyzing power in nuclear physics. And that's a bit much. Uh, if you're the experimentalist, you feel kind of wary. You know, what did I overlook? And is this really true? And what can I do to confirm the result? Well, what you can do is, for instance, do a different experiment. Uh, use an unpolarized beam and use a polarized target. And that's a major effort, but not with the cooler. With the cooler, you push a button. And the, uh, the magnets around the target do their thing, and the uh, computer in the injection of the polarized beam do their thing. So a few seconds later, you run the new experiment. And that's how it looks like. And after that, there were no more questions. And I'm sure you, you all are in this business. You can understand that the heart of an experimentalist uh, has joy with a result like that. During the whole period of CPOS, 
there were a, a constant stream of improvements going on. Uh, there was this this um, sorry this was being built the cooler injector injector synchrotron that was actually also a storage thing just to pre-accelerate the beam from i cannot too many buttons too close together uh, to uh, to get the beam from the polarized ion source that provides the beam in the cooler this was also new um, very intense injector a polarized ion source which was also built to polarize deuterons in addition to polarized protons the atomic beam source from madison was improved that's over here uh, was improved to produce deuterons as well now polarized deuterons that's a whole new story because deuterons have a different spin from protons i don't want to tom tom did some of that but it's uh, not easy to cram this in a few minutes so just believe me that deuterons need a bit more mathematical apparatus to describe the observables there are also quite a bit more observables possible and this is one example of a cooler result there are two energies left and right and plotted are uh, dp elastic scattering polarization observables all that are possible all of them uh, so there are deuteron polarization there are two kinds of deuteron polarization called vector and tensor they make two kinds of correlation coefficients so there are a whole number of observables uh, possible that can be measured the black dots are our data the red dots are what has been previously available uh, that was i mean i'm aware that i'm leaving out willie's uh, objection in the beginning that there is a little physics to be learned that was not true in the end he he did no longer think that and this is a, for instance a result which uh, there were contributions to the theory of three body forces and other kinds of things and so that was the indiana cool it is now history and uh, the people who are contributing to that are here the first few lines are universe the first two lines are the people from here then come the people from indiana like to here and then there are other people from other places which were here at the bottom but in reality they were figuring higher up and they were good contributors and uh, we uh, are proud of our achievement uh, one thing this is one piece that was instrumental all the data i have shown you today have been measured with this target uh, this was a flange that was mounted from below in the scattering chamber i earlier i showed the picture of myself reaching up uh, through that hole this uh, this target was reaching uh, the tube this thing here is paper thin you could hardly breathe at it without damaging it and it had a nipple somewhere there was an entry hole with this hole here connected to 
uh, feed unpolarized gas in there. That would be the unpolarized target. And that will be denser than the polarized target. So if you're on an unpolarized target, you can have a thicker target than with the polarized source. Uh, there is this thing here sticking up, uh, which was used for diagnostic measurements of the stored beam. And uh, this, the pipe here could be moved up and down and left and right with this apparatus. It was really ingenious. There were micro motors down here, and there were buttons at the control console. And there was a telescope at both ends of the straight section. And you could see that target in the telescope was connected to a camera. So in the control room, you saw that ring, and you could trace it out with a marker, and then you could shift it a little bit, then you do a measurement, then you do an adjustment. So it ha you had full control over the target position with the possibility of feedback. And this um, piece of equipment, um, to my knowledge, is the only part of the Indiana cooler who actually survived. Everything else has been scrapped. And this I saved at the critical time from the floor when it was about to disappear and moved to my office. I thought this meeting is a good opportunity to return it to the University of Wisconsin. Let's get it. It's yours again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, spectacular grand finale. <laughs> Thanks for a very really interesting talk. Questions? Dave? Uh, David Coker, Oak Ridge. Um, I have a very naive question <laughs> about the the relationship between the experimental results you have and some theory. Uh, you can either you can have an established or, or a hypothesized theory that you then try to see if your data fits it, or you can do it the other way around and say I have this data. Theorists get to work. Yes. And I'm guessing that it's kind of the latter than what you're about here. Yeah, there is one prime example of that. Um, which has nothing to do with polarization, but I can mention it anyway. Uh, I, I mentioned pion production. Mm -hmm. uh, we had so good control over the energy and over the interaction energy because the target was pr practically not there, it was so thin. So we knew exactly the interaction energy. So that makes it possible that you can go closer and closer to the threshold where it just becomes possible to make pions and follow the, the probability of being able to make a pion as a function of the excess energy above threshold. And we, we trace this out much closer to threshold that was ever before possible and compared with the theory calculations and they were way off. Yeah, I, I was thinking more about the, the, the deuterons on protons and just the various polarization parameters. Yes. The, there were no, were there pions involved in that study or was it below the pion threshold? 
Well, the pion production was also measured with all possible polarization observables. I, I'm just mentioning the one where I had an interaction with the theorist because theory just didn't fit our result. And this uh, it was Chuck Horowitz who analyzed the data and found that in the description of the nucleon nucleon interaction in the nucleus there's something missing, namely the contribution of the heavy mesons. So that's an example of uh, the physics contribution of the cool. How Other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, I have one. So um, I work on um, soft X-rays and especially on linearly polarized soft X-rays. And I was stunned by the fact that your polarization curves don't follow a Malus raw. They were not fit well by a cosine square, but by a cosine curve. Wait, which one was Sorry, that? a sine curve, because they started at zero. Both of them, the ones that went at counterface when you change the polarization of the target. Yeah, that one, that's a, a sine curve, right? It starts at zero. I would expect a cosine curve and I would expect it to be a cosine square, at this, least for polarized X-rays. Not a cosine. This is what I just this, said. This is not a scattering angle. This is what I just said. So can you explain why it is not a Malus law? Can you tell me the physics at the basis of it that makes it a sine curve? I cannot understand her. Could somebody tell me what she said? Yes. Can, can you explain the physics of it or why it is a sine curve rather than following a polarization law, which would be a Malus law with a cosine square shape as a function it's, of it's angle. It's not a cosine square which shape. This is what I'm this saying. Angle, no, no, this Can angle, you explain why, not how? This angle here uh, has, if it's in the middle, it's 180 degrees, then these two planes or a common plane, then parity conservation kicks in and that point has to be zero. This has to be zero, otherwise we would make a major discovery. Uh, and the rest is not, it, it can be calculated, but it's not a sign or a sign squared. Okay. I can see that it is not. The question was why, but I guess someone else will wants to answer it. Just give me one second. I think what Hans is saying is that at these zero crossings, it's effectively two protons going in one direction and the pion in the other direction. So it's effectively not the three body process anymore. It's two bodies. In that case, uh, parity. Yep, but those, those are the zero crossings. Exactly, they, are, exactly. they are explainable. Uh, Hupa wants to know why this is not a sign. For that, you have to work out the mathematics, and then you find that this is something like a sine squared times a cosine or something like that, something more involved than yeah. just a simple uh, trigonometric function. Thank you. Since we have two more minutes, are there more questions? Because I have another one, if there aren't any. You have one, yes. Scott Price. In some of the earlier talks, uh, there was a lot of discussion of the bad effects of the circulating high energy beam on, uh, on the uh, target cell. Uh, we have a clamshell uh, set up, very thin walls, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Why not just such the same thing at IUCF? are uh, in in the uh, bad effects case you were talking about fractions of amperes of of beam and a totally different energy source than in our case uh, in the end we had a very good polarized source but still you had a record of uh, maybe a milliamp stored in the beam so 
No, not nothing to worry about uh, that you damage something. And besides, uh, there is only a limited number of protons in the ring, and the milliamp means, you know, that's the one that come by, but they come by many times, and it's always the same ones. So there is no real energy stored in the beam. Thank you very much, Hans Otto. Thank I'll you. ask you my question during the coffee break. Let's have coffee.